So obviously this is about respiratory pharmacology. Um, kind of dear to my heart, I did my PhD dissertation on uh, theophylline and bovine respiratory disease. You'll see a slide later on of something I did with that. The, um, <clears throat> actually, I wanted to look at something else. Uh, I wanted to look at the effect of IV DMSO in uh, bovine pneumonia, except my major professor told me I had to take PCHEM if I did that. Uh, I said, never mind. <laughs> Though everything else was enough. Uh, the, um, I kind of divided this into attainable objectives. And you can see here what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to go through control of infection. You've had antibiotics, drugs and bugs, antifungals, those sorts of things. I hope you remember those, uh, particularly your first line therapies for pulmonary narcardiosis. You've got TMS, kennel cough that progresses to pneumonia due to Bordetella. You've got doxycycline in adults, clavamox in puppies. If it's a uh, <coughs> blastomycosis, uh, you're going to use an azole, most typically a triconazole, uh, uh, though others are possibilities. All right, uh, first thing, protective reflexes. Here you see these listed peristaltic activity of the cilia in the respiratory tract, variation in airflow, trapping in mucus, uh, phagocytosis. Largely, these four reflexes we try to leave intact and, and we aim to not uh, decrease them. We realize there are some things, uh, for example, if you use a uh, <coughs> uh, muscarinic antagonist like atropine or other anticholinergics, you can temporarily impair ciliary transport. Uh, <coughs> uh, if the mucus becomes very dry, which again occurs with antihistamines uh, because of their anticholinergic effects and the similar anticholinergics like atropine. That can be a problem. Steroids interfere uh, with phagocytosis and phagocytic killing. So largely we're trying to avoid those. I wanted to mention the two that we actually do intervene on. Uh, sneezing is a, a normal protective reflex uh, and it normally is episodic, okay? So you normally don't have to deal with it. They get on a sneezing jag two or three times and, and, and then they're done. The problem comes in in the rare, rare case where they get a foreign body in their nasal cavity. And there it can be just continuous sneezing, uh, really severe and uh, you need to intervene there until you can get the foreign body removed under anesthesia and endoscopy. There we use a topical anesthetic. Uh, so you can take, uh, what a lot of people do is they'll take the ophthalmic propericane uh, because being ophthalmic is pH adjusted and it doesn't sting very much and they'll tilt the nose up and put the, the drops uh, in the nose. Uh, that's commonly done when we pass the nasogastric tube or nasoesophageal tube. <coughs> uh, to facilitate that. You can use regular lidocaine if you don't have the ophthalmic. Uh, it helps if you buffer it with a little sodium bicarb, about 1 cc of 8% injectable bicarb to 9 cc's of lidocaine right before you use it will buffer it where it won't sting so much. One of the things that I would do in the critical care lab is I would take lidocaine jelly uh, and saline in separate syringes, connect them with a three-way stopcock set so the two syringes would mix and I'd push them back and forth and particularly if you get the little um, valve set where there's uh, kind of a small opening you can push it through but there's a lot of turbulence you actually create a foam and I found that useful in that when I uh, put it in the nose it would spread better than just the drops. You won't find that written out anywhere but you can abolish the sneeze reflex I mentioned benzocaine is causing that hemoglobin anemia in cats, and it does, but dogs as well, uh, it's been reported, so we just avoid benzocaine uh, altogether. Uh, that you may never have cause to do. Uh, I mentioned it in case you do, but that would be relatively rare to have to work on a sneeze reflex. Coughs, on the other hand, uh, you're going to deal with um, uh, the rest of your career if you go into clinical medicine. 
Uh, why do it? Uh, it prevents dissemination of the infection to other animals if it's spread by aerosols and to other healthy tissues. All right, it may go from a disease lobe to a non-disease lobe. You can rupture uh, lung abscesses, uh, but it interferes with the sleep and rest, uh, and that can be not an insignificant thing. I may have told you the, the first dog my wife and I adopted from a shelter had kennel cough and we didn't know it, and that first night we spent the dog under our bed coughing the entire night, and neither the dog nor we got any sleep. Uh, <coughs> so um, those are all reasons you want to do it. What you don't want to do uh, is symptomatic treatment without a diagnosis, all right? Uh, it's tempting just to abolish the cough, but you need to know why the dog is coughing. So just arbitrary use can delay a proper diagnosis and treatment. One where it's particularly an issue is if the cough reflex is uh, preventing aspiration pneumonias from occurring and a tracheoesophageal fistula is one, uh, again, fairly rare phenomena, but you don't want to block that cough reflex in that situation. All right, so <laughs> what are the antitussives? And an antitussive is a cough suppressant uh, that uh, are used. This first slide are the ones that really either don't work very well uh, are certainly are not a mainstay. Uh, the um, demulcents are syrups. Uh, usually they just have a soothing effect uh, on the, the pharynx. Um, <coughs> and the same with mucosal anesthetics. You can get lozenges for humans with local anesthetics in them. This is more for sore throat than cough. Uh, these really don't help in veterinary medicine. The only reason they help in human medicine to some degree, and this includes your, your hauls, cough drops, this sort of thing, is if there's a lot of uh, post-nasal drainage, sinus drainage associated with the, uh, the cold or uh, sinusitis. There, that sinus drainage will get back in the back of the pharynx and irritate it and tickle it and cause a cough. So uh, using these in those situations may be of some benefit, okay? Uh, those just don't apply in veterinary medicine. Uh, one of the things we've found uh, is that bronchodilators sometimes decrease the cough reflex, and it's based on the theory that bronchoconstriction is one of the primary stimulus uh, for a cough. So we, we seldom use call, um, <coughs> uh, bronchodilators specifically as antitussives, but if you have reason to use a uh, bronchodilator, you may see a decrease in, in uh, severity and frequency of the cough. But nearly all of the ones that work, work centrally uh, on the cough center in the brain in the medullary ones. All right. Uh, <clears throat> let me address these uh, top two. Dextromethorphan is a non-narcotic antitussive, uh, but it does non-narcotic, and narcosis just means uh, induces um, sleep. All right. It is typically synonymous with opioids, probably more correctly I should say opioids, antitussives here. Uh, it's not technically in structure an opioid, but it does bind to the opioid receptors in the medullary cough center. And this is what is in all of your over-the-counter cough remedies that actually work. So Robitussin, these sorts of things, uh, <coughs> and they are effective in humans for mild to moderate cough. Okay, and uh, for as long as I can remember, it's been kind of a fallback in, uh, in dogs where, you know, the owner calls you at 10 o'clock at night because they're like me, they got the puppy from the Humane Society and the cough is, is uh, a problem. And veterinarians would say, well, go down to the 7-Eleven and get a bottle of Robitussin and give X amount, okay. It does help, but relatively short-lived is the problem. Uh, the kinetics are different in the dog. Uh, relatively poor bioavailability 
and short half-life. So it's something that you can recommend, but don't expect uh, a very sustained duration. Uh, they need to come in the next day and, uh, and get something uh, more appropriate. Antihistamines, Benadryl, diphenhydramine is in a lot of these over-the-counter cough preparations. <coughs> uh, I had minimally effective, and that's been the predominant view. Uh, I did a literature search about 30 minutes ago just seeing if anything had changed. And there's a little bit of data that says in humans it might have a benefit in cough suppression. Uh, I can only find one article from 1962 that I sent off for that addresses it in the dog that said that uh, at the dose they used it had a benefit but only for about two hours. Uh, so that was the abstract. I'm, I'm waiting for the, the whole thing. So. Uh, these are things that you can uh, have the owner get over the counter that might give some relief until they can come in uh, for a proper antitussif. By the way, relative to these cough suppressants, um, you often see them in a mix. So they've got dextromethorphan, antihistamine, and decongestant. Uh, and I try to steer them away from the decongestant. Uh, particularly, ideally, not even the um, antihistamine, though arguably maybe that's okay. But you sometimes see some animals that get a little hyper from some of the decongestants, the phenylephrine, uh, this sort of thing that's in there, a little bit of agitation. And most people that say they can't take a uh, cold remedy because it makes them wired, that's more commonly from the, the decongestant than it is from the antitussive or the antihistamine. Okay. Now, that gets us to what really works. And you want to interact with these opioid receptors. Uh, and opioids uh, are kind of our gold standard. All the opioids will do it with the exception of oxymorphone. And it will suppress it somewhat. But oxymorphone, which is an injection, is the uh, least in terms of having an antitussive effect. So if I think I need an opioid for uh, pain control in a severely painful animal, uh, but I want to maintain that cough reflex, i.e. the tracheoesophageal fistula or something similar, then I'll opt for oxymorphone. Otherwise, you can use anything. Hydrocodone has been kind of the gold standard for decades. You know it is Hycodan. Uh, <clears throat> but any of the uh, opioids will do it. The problem with Hycodan now is about a year ago, maybe two now, there was such a, an abuse problem in humans with hydrocodone that the DEA moved all codeine prepar hydrocodone preparations to class two DEA control drug status. All right, and that puts a lot more paperwork and hurdles in your pathway in terms of dispensing it. Prior to that, it had been a class three, all right, but now it's a class two and that somewhat limits us. Um, <clears throat> codeine, interestingly, though not used much in veterinary medicine, is kind of the gold standard when we're trying to uh, rate the antitussive activity, uh, we compare it against codeine. All right, uh, not used that much in veterinary medicine. Again, hydrocodone has been used somewhat. Although now that that's Schedule II, we might consider Tylenol number three or something like that. Uh, the doses required for cough suppression are a lot lower than the doses required for pain control. So you may see a benefit there. Um, <clears throat> uh, just a personal note, I, I found I hate cough syrups. I actually hate them. Uh, uh, I almost gag when I take a cough syrup. Uh, and and the, the, the vehicle, the syrup, actually is oftentimes um, glycerol guacolate or guafenicin, you know, as mucinex, uh, as a pure form, but it's, it's mainly a vehicle to carry it, and I hate it. So the last time I had a bad cough, I asked my physician, for, give me some sort of tablet. Don't make me take cough suppressant. He said, there are none. And, uh, with, and I, I said, well, give me a Tylenol number three then. And he did, and it worked. <laughs> so I got away from the damn cough syrup. Um, now, uh, 
this is now a Schedule II, uh, so you can instead go with butorphanol uh, as an agonist antagonist. It's a very effective cough suppressant. And I mentioned that the dose required for cough suppression is a lot lower than the dose required for pain control. So we can give butorphanol orally as a cough suppressant. It's really, really hard to give enough orally for pain control. You have to give huge amounts because of the high first pass effect. But we do give it uh, orally for cough suppression. And in that regard, uh, both do a good job. It's kind of which is the least problem in terms of paperwork and which is the least expensive. Uh, for a long time, butorphanol was not used as much as hydrocodone because it was a good bit more expensive to use, especially in a large breed dog, so uh, the hydrocodone uh, priced out better. Uh, now that we have the, the uh, uh, class two status, I suspect more butorphanol is, is being uh, given. Now, uh, there are a couple of drugs that have are not typically classified as antitussives that are sometimes used where we don't want to have the dog on long-term opioid. Uh, the opioids we use, or butorphanol as an agonist antagonist, typically are best used for short duration problems. So, you know, uh, three to five days a week, maybe two weeks, this sort of thing. But we typically don't want to keep them on long-term. So trying to find something that is a long-term cough suppressant uh, we've been looking for. One is Serenia uh, Ropitant. Uh, it's approved as an antimatic, of course, in dogs and cats, but it is a neurokinin receptor antagonist. And there was one study in chronic bronchitis in dogs that though they didn't see the anti-inflammatory effect they were hoping for, they hoped that by inhibiting uh, substance P, which is neurokinase, one that they would have an anti-inflammatory effect. They didn't see that. They didn't change the cell counts, the influx of white cells, this sort of thing. But there was a pretty good decrease in uh, the severity and frequency of cough. So Serenia is uh, an option for you. One that our clinicians here really like for chronic bronchitis is low modal, which is diphenoxalate and atropine. And again, uh, uh, the atropine is there primarily to prevent abuse. Uh, this is a uh, oral uh, tablet and diphenoxalate doesn't normally cross the blood-brain barrier very much, but it does enough uh, that if people jack up the dose, they can get a high from the diphenoxalate. So they added the atropine to make it less appealing as a drug abuse. Uh, it's hard to be, uh, enjoy a high, I presume, <laughs> if your heart is racing and your mouth is dry and you can't urinate. So, <laughs> so that's why the atropine is there. You might say, well, maybe it helps with diarrhea too as a parasympatholytic, and maybe it does, but this has a, atropine has a pretty fur, high first pass effect. So mainly it's there for uh, substance abuse issues. Uh, there is no hard data that this helps, but a lot of people believe it, it does have a beneficial effect in cough suppression in some of these chronic bronchitises. Okay, so you'll li li likely see that. I'm waiting for a trial to come out to actually prove it, but a lot of people do use it and think it works. 